Um, so thank you for the invitation to come and speak today. I'm going to be uh, speaking, as you know, about targeted therapies for melanoma in the era of personalized medicine. Um, and I just wanted to start by saying, and I loved your slide of your kids, um, because I think of my two-year-old and my four-year-old, my husband's family's from Eastern Europe. I'm the darkest person in my family, and they have no chance of going tanning before the prom. They're very strong-willed, and I can already see the fights that are gonna happen in about 10 years. So um, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the new developments in melanoma, and I will be acknowledging um, pharmaceutical support as it applies to individual trials that I'll be talking about. The targets for discussion would be to discuss the concept of what is personalized medicine. It appears to be one of the buzzwords and the buzz topics, you know, on the streets today. It's all over the internet. So I'll be talking a little bit about what that means I'd like to briefly summarize the hot developments in targeted therapy in melanoma right now, and then we'll be focusing on some really new novel targets that are going to have possible relevance in melanoma where, you know, just not sure if it's, it's the right place to go at this moment in time, but it's certainly, um, certainly places that are interesting areas to study. So what is personalized medicine? I started by going to the NIH website and just trying to, just literally typing in personalized medicine and coming up with a couple of review articles written by some of the experts. And back in 2008, there was a very good review article in a journal called Cancer Research, which proclaimed that the future of cancer care just lies in this concept, um, a model fo that focuses on the individual and not just the disease as a whole. Personalized medicine and cancer care will need to use molecular signatures to match the right patients to the right drugs first in trials and then in practice. And then two years later, a review in, in uh, Nature continues to proclaim that the knowledge of the molecular profile of the tumor is necessary to guide selection ther of therapy for the patient. Essentially, this, this fits very, very, um, this is very, very relevant to melanoma because most of us accept the fact that melanoma is a very complex disease. It's really not just one disease. It's what we call very heterogeneous, very, very different in different people. Then I did what any self-respecting person does did, and I went and Googled the concept of personalized medicine, and it even has a Wikipedia entry, um, which proclaims, again, that personalized medicine is a medical model that emphasizes a systematic use of information about an individual patient to select or optimize that patient's preventative and therapeutic care. And the, the final sentence, it's often decides, de defined as the right treatment for the right person at the right time. Sounds great. Um, the goals of trying to take a targeted, targeted approach of can to cancer treatment are to develop therapies that are designed to interrupt molecular pathways known to be important for the cell growth and survival of cancer cells. Molecular profiling of tumors to better assess the likelihood of benefit from treatment is also something that fits nicely into this paradigm. You know, if you are a patient with melanoma, you could possibly have your tumor analyzed and, and find the targets that are going to be the most important in treating your specific type of cancer. It would also be great to be able to develop ways to find out if your tumor had a signature or something that would show that you were particularly prone to responding or being too resistant to a particular type of treatment since we have so many new treatments coming out in oncology these days. It's not as easy as it sounds. It sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, um, the challenges that, that complicate a targeted approach is that we have more drugs now than ever before in development. And we're also finding out we have more diseases in that. Um, diseases that in the, in the past we thought maybe were just heterogeneous or one disease are actually a bunch of little different subtypes. The standards for clinical research, thankfully, are rising, but it does mean that it takes longer time to complete studies and longer time to reach the endpoints the studies are designed to meet. And there is, of course, documentation and regulatory complexity that's involved in running clinical trials and, and bringing agents um, through the FDA into development. So I would like to echo Jed's sentiment about how important clinical research is. Um, at the Cancer Institute of New Brunswick, most of us have buttons that say, ask me about a clinical trial. Um, we will never get anywhere without producing quality clinical research, and, and I'm very grateful to the patients that actually do participate in this research because they're really who are responsible for allowing us to make the strides that we've made. They're really, truly, for the ma vast majority of cancers, despite the progress we, are, we have made, no curative therapy exists, and the major breakthroughs of the last decade could not have occurred without clinical research. 
Many cancers, such as metastatic melanoma, do not have effective first-line therapy, which prolongs survival, which just underscores the, the, the importance of clinical studies. Anna briefly alluded to the types of clinical trials initially. Um, we have what we call developmental therapeutics, or that phase one study that she had talked about initially. And that's really, in some ways, just trying to find what the safe dose is of a combination in human beings, although we certainly do these days, I think, try to tailor phase one trials very much to matching patients um, whose, science, whose disease would fit the science of the trial. We also have in development these phase zero studies uh, recently, and phase zero is, is a bit of a novel concept because these studies are actually really often given without a therapeutic benefit, meaning that we are only really just trying to see what the drug does in either healthy patients or patients who are able to be treated for a short period of time to see if the drug actually does what we think it's supposed to do in people before we move it on to the more extensive phase one, two, and three studies. Phase two trials are, are trials that tend to see if, if, or try to see if we have anti-tumor activity. Is it possibly going to be successful in treating a specific disease type? And then there is the all-important phase three study where the standard of care is compared against the novel treatment. These studies may be in investigator initiated by you know, academics or people at your doctor at a, at a particular university. They may be sponsored by a drug company or they may be sponsored by large cooperative groups which exist throughout the country who partner together to conduct these studies. So I think, you know, at least with breast cancer and the development of the molecule called Herceptin, which you may have heard of, that, per that targets a receptor called HER2 in breast cancer, we've at least got the ideal paradigm for targeted therapy. There was a mechanism of tumor aggression that was determined for a subset of patients with breast cancer. They developed a specific drug against that receptor, and then they were able to do clinical trials with patients and tumors who expressed the target, and lo and behold, we wound up having a therapy that prolonged survival and has really changed the natural history of breast cancer and HER2 positive patients. So melanoma, we're not quite there yet. Um, in 2009, the bottom line, as Dr. Wolchuk said, is that there was no FDA-approved therapy that exists which prolongs survival at this point in time. There are debates about chemotherapy, and if we've studied chemotherapy the right way, if the right kinds of studies or large enough studies have been done, but at this point in time, we can't say that it, it confers a survival benefit to patients with melanoma, meaning if you treat them with it, they may not live longer. Um, Long-term durable remissions can be seen with high-dose interleukin-2. Unfortunately, it is in a small percentage of patients that this occurs, and the therapy does have side effects. It was very sobering last year at ASCO when Dr. Lynn Schechter from the University of Pennsylvania stood up and reminded us that she did an informal review of abstracts over the last decade. And 75% of those abstracts, these preliminary reports at our, at our clinical meetings, declared we had a promising or a clinically active regimen. And here we are 10 years later, and while we're on the brink, I think, of some really exciting developments, the standard of care still remains a clinical trial in melanoma. Fortunately, I do believe that the standards and the rigor of clinical trials have increased, and we're finally getting much smarter about the way that we're conducting clinical research. So I'd like to take some time to talk about promising agents. And we've already seen this slide, or at least uh, slides resembling this earlier today. This is that very important MAPK signaling pathway in melanoma. And the pink side of the slide is healthy melanocytes, and, and the yellow side of the slide is, is ab aberrant melanomas. Um, and we know that there's proteins called BRAF and NRAS that act very high up in that pathway, which if they are deranged or unregulated, are able to allow melanoma cells to grow uncontrolled. I'm very, very grateful to Dr. Keith Flaherty, who's now at Mass General Hospital, for sharing his slides of the BRAF inhibitor plexicon drug, which has made a lot of press and has been shared in the New York Times. And recently I heard there was also a big article in a Canadian journal that was quite impressive as well. And these are the centers that, that participated in that, initial, in that initial trial. This is a slide that we've already seen today. It's also quite familiar, where essentially we have this important ras raf mech erk signaling pathway that leads to uncontrolled cell proliferation in cancer cells. And the BRAF protein, the V600E mutation in particular, has been shown to lead to unchecked and uncontrolled cell proliferation in melanoma cells in patients that have the mutation in this protein. I would say it's, it's thought to be about 60% of patients in melanoma that have this mutation. 
So the plexicon drug kind of fits in the pocket of, and inhibits the kinase do domain of the, the kinase domain or the protein active signaling domain of that BRAF mutant protein. So it's an effective inhibitor of this kinase or this protein gone wrong in cell signaling in melanoma. And the, the premise would be that it's, this is actually responsible for growth arrest when it's given to patients that have this mutation that's kind of out of control. So this, these are the results of a phase one trial. And again, the phase one study really is just to explore what is the safe dose. And also these days, we kind of tend to do these extension, extension cohorts at the top of a phase one trial, meaning we get to the end of the study, and then we try to see if we treat more patients at the dose that we think is effective, are we gonna see any kind of signal that's going to lead us to think this could be promising? So there's a bunch of scientific terms on this slide. Um, you know, did, when you hear, if you, any of you may be, you know, thinking about being in a clinical study or have a friend or a relative, um, you know, you hear this word, the MTD. The MTD is what we call the maximum tolerated dose, and, and it really is the primary goal of a lot of these early phase one studies. What is that tolerated dose we can give to patients with melanoma? And then we also look to see what kind of toxicities we're observing, so that way we can you know, learn about the side effect profile of the drug in patients. So the conclusions of this drug, when they actually treated in the phase one trial, initially it, it, it didn't appear necessarily that it was gonna be a home run in patients with melanoma. There was some finagling, they needed to get to the right dose. Um, but what was very dramatic in the end was that in patients that actually had that BRAF mutant protein, the responses were you know, pretty impressive. 11 partial responses were seen out of 16 patients, nine of them which were, had been confirmed at the time that these slides were made. There was certainly regression of liver, lung, and bone disease, which in melanoma, we get pretty excited over that. And the most important thing also is that patients felt better taking the drug. Side effects, all medications have side effects. Rashes, fatigue, arthralgias, arthralgias are like bone pains. Nausea, sensitivity to light in your skin, um, and elevated bilirubin levels, which is an enzyme your liver produces. Interestingly, there was also an in increased incidence of squamous cell carcinoma of the skin. However, most of these were excisable and manageable. And again, there's the thing that we, we found most exciting about this is that we saw in patients that had that mutation a 70% response rate, which in melanoma means something. Um, and I'd like to show a bunch of you know, very interesting pictures. Um, we see in, on the left sides of the slide are patients that you know, had melanoma. There's that PET scan we talked about before where the lights that are dark, we like to call that they're hot on a PET scan. And then post-treatment, we do see significant resolution of that, those hot areas indicating that disease is responding. This, um, the, the little blurbs in the, in the lung on the left side of the slide tend to be um, kind of looking like golf balls in there. That's, those are cancerous areas in melanoma. And then the post-treatment slide, you see that they're significantly smaller. Again, fairly impressive. And again, this is a, the, the red uh, arrow on the slide is pointing to an area of the bowel that's involved with melanoma. As Dr. Guaidos talked about earlier, melanoma can get inside the bowel and seed certain areas. And post-treatment, there we see that, again, that's significantly smaller. Um, but this is my final picture where the, the, I wish I had a pointer over here, the gray areas in the, in the liver pre-treatment are disease, and you see that getting significantly smaller by cycle four. So this is, you know, pretty amazing stuff. The conclusions to date, because I think we still have to remember these are results of a phase one study, and we still are studying this, this agent in phase two and three trials. But the conclusions that we can say to date is that there are common toxicities that occur, with, with, but still the drug still tends to be well tolerated, including arthralgias, rash, photosensitivity, and fatigue. And that we did see this increased incidence of squamous cell carcinoma. In patients that had that BRAF mutation, we did see a high incidence of, response, high incidence of responses, and the median progression-free survival has not yet been reached in this study. Future development is going from a phase one to a phase two, and I believe that the phase two has already been completed. There's a phase three trial now of this agent versus decarbazine, or what is considered the standard of care in many situations uh, for malignant melanoma, and that's accruing at this point in time. They're also obviously going to start looking at this agent in other tumors besides melanoma that have this BRAF mutation. So is this the answer? 
Unfortunately, it would be lovely, but I don't think we're home free. I think already there's starting to be signs that just like chemotherapy, melanoma tumors can be, become smart and outsmart this agent and develop mechanisms of resistance. And that's something that I think is gonna be an active area of future study. What causes this resistance? How do we prevent it? Should we be looking at this agent in combination with other agents? I think the, the answer is definitely going to be yes. And I think it's going to be an important part of the future of, of this compound. I'm gonna take a moment and switch gears and talk about a, a pathway that, so the BRAF protein is active in the majority of, of melanoma patients. Um, the CKIT pathway is, is, tends to be aberrant or uncontrolled signaling in, in, in contrast in the minority of patients. This is actually a pathway that we, we are used to being very, very important in cancers of the blood or leukemias. And we are actually able to inhibit uh, CKIT, which is a signaling molecule in that previous pathway with a drug you may have heard of called a matinib or Gleevec. This really changed the landscape of treatment for chronic myelogenous leukemia in the last decade. It was studied initially in melanoma, and three prior phase two studies in 62 patients with advanced melanoma reported only one response. Not very good. Um, there are also other CK inhibitors, a drug called desatinib looked at in melanoma, and again, three of 30 patients partial responses. Okay, that's 10%. Um, however, it was noted that a proportion of melanomas that come from chronic sun damaged areas or mucosal areas in the, in the rectum or in the mouth possibly could have mutations of this kit protein and that this subset of melanomas was more likely to have a mutation. So my colleague Rich Carvajal at Memorial Sloan Kettering hypothesized that maybe this subset of tumors would be the ones that would actually respond to this agent. He reported this data last year at ASCO. If you personalize it with the CK inhibitor and matinib, patients with who were, had unresectable melanoma but whose tumor had a mutation were allowed to be treated with the agent. And as you see, it's a, you know 17 patients out of 81 tumors who could possibly have that mutation. Only 21% of the people actually had the mutation. So the frequency is relatively low. Um, but of those 17 patients, there were you know, enough responses seen, three out of 17, which allowed us to go to a second stage of studying this agent. Interestingly, the other CK inhibitor, desatinib, is actually going to be looked at in locally advanced or metastatic mucosal, acral, or solar melanoma. Again, the same, the same melanomas that could possibly have this kit mutation versus previously when we kind of just lumped all melanoma together and looked at it in that perspective. So again, if we get a little smarter and try to personalize it, perhaps we can achieve better results. So what's in the pipeline? What's new and hot and coming down the track? I think it's, it's important to take a moment to talk about targeting DNA repair through PARP inhibition, poly-ADP ribose polymerase. It's a mouthful. This is interesting because cancer cells in general are highly susceptible to DNA repair inhibition. They undergo unregulated growth and they have less time for repair than normal cells because they divide very, very quickly when a tumor takes off. These cells are also able to grow under stress, but that stress causes damage to DNA or the genetic material that makes us, us. Um, so essentially the cancer cells have DNA repair defects, but they're still reliant on, on our body pathways that repair the DNA. So PARP is an enzyme that's involved in the repair of single strand DNA breaks. You have DNA damage, you have the PARP enzyme that binds to the DNA and tries to, to help repair it up. So if you're able to break the DNA, as sometimes happens when your cells are dividing, and then inhibit the enzyme that actually is responsible for fixing it, you could possibly result in slowed, you know, slowed tumor replication and slowed tumor cell growth. This is, import this is important in melanoma because at least in mice, and let's be honest, we cure lots of mice, we need to, to work on curing people, but we do like to sometimes see in the laboratory that things are, are working the way they want them to before we, we move on to clinical research. Um, but if you looked at the PARP inhibitors with temozolomide, which is um, a chemotherapy agent that also damages DNA and is used often in the treatment of melanoma, appeared to be you know, control of disease in mice. And there recently was a trial of this, ag of this agent, which I believe also has is at least accrued. The data are not mature yet, but it's certainly, I think, an area to watch in terms of looking at uh, development for anti-cancer agents. I'm going to take a few minutes and talk about some of the science we're looking at, Jim and I at CINJ and our melanoma program. It's a little bit homegrown, um, but it's very, very interesting because it's a 
bit of serendipity in this story. Um, we work with a, a scientist across the river at Rutgers University by the name of Dr. Chen, who literally noticed that some transgenic mice that she was working with were found to develop melanoma spontaneously. Further studies found that a receptor called metabotropotropic glutamate receptor 1, which I'll just refer to as GRM1, um, was found in, in the melanocytes of these, uh, of these mice. And I'll, next I'll show a picture kind of what the, the mice looked like. They certainly were, you know, growing these very profound melanomatous tumors. And it was thought that the GRM1 receptor was involved in, in making these tumors grow. If you took, take a look at pictures of the mouse tails, you have a control and also a tail that is involved with tumor. So you can see the difference between mice that are overexpressing this GRM1 protein and those that are not. And so studies were then performed on human tissues to see if, in fact, the melanotic tumors from human tumor sample tissues that we had were actually also expressing the GRM1. And it was found that, lo and behold, that that was true. 60% of, of human tissues that were, human melanomas that were studied were found to ex express this very interesting receptor. This receptor is involved in the metabolism of a protein called glutamate, which, as we know, is very important for nervous system responses to many different kinds of stimuli, such as pain, um, vision processing, memory, and other brainstem functions in your body. So it's something that we, you need on a normal basis. This is kind of a picture or schematic of that glutamate receptor that's up in the top right-hand corner. And it signals, we think, although we're not sure, we think it kind of signals down and, and influences um, through a protein called PI3 kinase and then winds up influencing also that very important ras raf mec erc signaling pathway. It's important in melanoma, although we're still looking into the mechanism of this. And so, as again, we looked at, at human melanomas and we found that they had high expression of this protein and we also looked at benign lesions and found that they didn't, which was reassuring. And Dr. Goidos very, very intelligently did a, did, then did a search to see if there was any drugs out there, even right now, that could possibly block this GRM1 receptor. And lo and behold, there is a drug out there for the treatment of Lou Gehrig's disease called Riluzol. Um, Riluzol is an inhibitor of glutamate release and it activates voltage-dependent sodium channels. And it was FDA approved with not a lot of toxicity, and so we decided to start looking, or he decided to start looking at this in patients before, before I arrived at CINJ. These are just some slides to show that the bottom line, which shows the least growth, are the cells that were treated with the really is all compared to no treatment, which is the top line. So it, it, it looked as if it was actually suppressing in the laboratory human melanoma cell growth. And if also, if we did mouse models of human tumors, it also appeared that giving the really is all, in fact, did suppress the tumor growth. So Dr. Goyos designed a phase zero trial of Riluzol in patients with resectable melanoma. Now let's talk a little bit about that phase zero concept I mentioned before. Um, this study really is, in some ways, a very quick way to see if the drug is even doing what we want it to do in patients. And these are patients who are actually already scheduled to go to surgery for melanoma. Um, and they, there was a PET scan done pre, before their surgery. They had a biop, small biopsy of their tumor taken, which they graciously volunteered to do. Um, and they were given 14 days of the, of the Riluzol drug and then had another PET scan and then had their surgery. And this allowed Dr. Goidos to compare pre and post treatment tumors to see if there are any decreases in cell division or increases in cell death or decreased levels of proteins that, would thought, that were thought to be active in melanoma growth. These phase zero trials are actually usually very small studies because if, if your tumor, if your drug is hitting the target that you want it to hit, it's, you should have a, a good enough way of detecting that target that you would need to, to do it. You would be able to do the study quickly in a very small number of patients. Um, so we had 12 patients on our trial and, and not a lot of toxicity, although this drug does tend to make people dizzy, which I've seen more than once. Um, in that small number of patients given the drug for a short period of time, three patients had clinical responses. Um, so that's, you know, pretty interesting. Three out of 12, it's, it's pretty interesting to us. Um, so we then also went to look at the PET scans and four patients actually had um, changes on the PET scan intensity when they, we went to look at their post-treatment PET scan. Um, pa four patients also had decreased activity in some of those proteins in that raf ras mec erc pathway that we think are important. And this, this slide shows a picture of the, the bottom is actually the pretreatment and the top is the post-treatment. You see a decline in the, the uptake on the PET scan as we expect. And so what we were able to conclude from this trial is that we can administer a drug that's already FDA approved without a lot of toxicity to patients with melanoma. 
and possibly see some evidence of, of anti-tumor activity. Um, however, I think what we need to remember is this is a very small number of patients, and what we really we weren't really trying to see anti-tumor activity. We wanted to see if the drug, you know, hit the target and hit the proteins that we wanted it to hit, and it appeared that that was actually happening. Um, so, with that in mind, we decided that moving on to a larger study, a phase two trial, would be indicated at this point. So, what we know is that at least on two weeks of drug therapy, maybe this is you know showing something. But now we've got to find out if we give it to patients with advanced disease on a longer schedule, is it actually having some evidence of decreasing the activity of the tumor? So our future plans with this are to complete that phase two trial. We're thinking about doing this, the, using this agent in combination with other therapies because I think we know that melanoma is pretty smart and has a lot of pathways that are activated and, and just hitting one may not be enough. Um, there's also other uh, GRM1 antagonists that are in development currently. So this is just a list to give you guys an overview of how clinical research works. These are just four pathways in addition to all the other ones that I just described, just to give you guys an idea of the complexity of, of what's going on and, and what goes on in, in drug development when we try to study um, how agents act in patients. Um, and I think what we've got to remember is, with my final thoughts, we've made significant strides for sure, um, and there's still a long way to go. That said, we've got more promise in melanoma than we've ever seen before in recent years. Um, the discovery of novel targets and pathways, however, I think remains crucial because I don't think we have all the answers yet. And personalized therapy, however, is still becoming more and more relevant. I would very much like to acknowledge Keith Flaherty who shared his slides with me and without his very nice pictures, this talk would not have been as, uh, as spruced up. And also my colleagues in the Melanoma Sarcoma Research Unit at CINJ and finally my patients who are, who are generous to be on clinical studies and who are also just mostly incredible people. Thank you.